Okay, <laughs> I've published few work and sort of I've, I've gone around a different fields, um, different domains of, of deep learning. Uh, I started using neural networks really early before it was really working before the term deep learning really came about. Uh, and then once on the on the deep, learn, deep learning era, also worked on computer vision. Um, there's a work that we propose to improve convolution to be um, translation translation aware. And and then lately, I've also worked on NLP. So it's sort of like a sampling different uh, different flavors from different fields. Uh, kind of as I said, non-traditional, but it's been really fun. I also um, run a weekly reading group where we read a paper a week. Uh, it's as simple as that. Actually, we don't even read it. I invite a speaker, usually the author of the paper, to come and talk to us about that paper because I'm lazy. I don't sometimes say that's like my method to keep up with the research. I invite someone to tell me what that paper is about. Um, so feel free to join. Uh, the link is in the slides and on my website. I, I try to put it everywhere. So you know, people who are interested in joining can always join. It's free and open to the public. And I co-founded and am currently managing a nonprofit research org called, called ML Collective. Basically, we're trying to change the ways people become researchers or at least providing an alternative to people to become researchers. Like maybe you don't feel like going to grad school, but you're still interested in publishing research. We're pro providing a ways to do that. You can have a full-time job to support yourself, or if you feel, you know, leaving your full-time job and, and focusing on just research full-time, you're able to do that. So all those alter alternate paths to become a researcher we're supporting. And we're supporting you with um, mentorship and everything's free. Cool. Uh, let's get to today's content. Basically, we're talking about NLP, natural language processing. So what is natural language processing? Well, very plainly, it is the understanding of human languages, of course, using tools in computer science and machine learning. And interestingly, maybe if you're working on computer vision, you would think uh, first problems, first few problems you would think about would be, you know, image classification and object detection. So all those, you know, what I call summarize, summarization problems, meaning you look at some data, you're trying to make meanings out of it by, you know, summarize it into, say, a class or you know, some, some, some notions to describe this image, a concise notion. But interestingly, if you're working on language, you almost like the first problem you would start thinking is producing that language. Somehow, if you are you know, studying language with machine, you would naturally think that, OK, I will be interested in training a machine to produce such language. Of course, in image um, tasks, you have such things. You have GANs. You have generators. You have generative modeling. But at least uh, in my experience, sort of like generative modeling comes later uh, in your st studying path. You sort of study the first basic problem first, and then you move on to generative modeling because it's generally harder in the machine, in computer vision field to think about generation. But in language field, not that it's easier, but somehow it comes more natural to people's mind that uh, if you're studying this, you come, you know, naturally think about how do I produce language with machine? So that's like maybe one little difference. Also, at the same time, you want to solve all the tasks in NLP, and there are like thousands of tasks in NLP, uh, like translation, like question answering, like making conversation, conversational bots, uh, all those application areas and problems um, in NLP. So now that you've probably like heard a bit of um, computer vision from the previous lecture, you might wonder how, how is it different working in NLP versus working in computer vision? Uh, say, as a researcher? Well, a lot of them is the same. <laughs> if you're using machine learning, you gather some data, you train some big model, it does things, you observe a loss curve going down. That's sort of like your daily uh, activity. So sort of that is the same. There are slightly more work to process text, text, text data, uh, just because in vision, we're lucky that images come in RGB uh, or some other you know, color map format, and they're already uh, exist in a in a number, right? That you can easily do matmul, which is uh, the the most you know popular operation you have in in deep learning. So they're already in a format that you can do matrix multiplication. You're they're already in a format that you can just feed into neural networks. It's slightly different with text. They come in you know in a string of of um, 
characters and basically you have to make sense of it, how to make computer able to read the text. So there's slightly more work to process text data um, and learn ways to process such data. Um, you probably try to, would try to get more familiar with probabilistic notions because I think the starting of NLP people already are thinking about questions of like, what's the probability of a sentence? What's the probability of words? So the notion of statistical modeling and probabilistics sort of exist early in people's minds, where of course that's, that's sometimes the case in uh, computer vision as well, but not as much, I would say. Um, partly because we, in when working with language, we are dealing with tokens in a discrete world and just very easy to think about, okay, for all the words in, in, the, in, the, in the world that exists, uh, if you add them up, the probability should be one, and then each word should have a little probability associated with it. So the, the notion of probabilistic modeling and statistics uh, sort of like exist in your mind more often than if you're working on computer vision. And uh, as I said, because they are discrete symbols and because they are sort of harder to process to feed into neural networks, you probably learn a few additional things to make text work in a neural network friendly space. So what I mean by that is, you know, what neural network likes is that everything comes in as a flow number so that they can do mat mule um, matrix multiplication. Uh, so, but task doesn't come naturally in that format. So sort of have to do a few things to do that. Um, so neural network like that because it's fully differentiable, it's easy, there's no sampling, but in text you encounter you know, the break of differentiability very often. So you have to come up with sort of workarounds to do it. So that's like a few differences, but as I said, most of them is the same. Um, so, so as I said, because text doesn't lie in that space yet, instead of continuous, it's very discrete. So the first question we would find us facing is that how do we process text? So at the bottom, it is a string of characters. Um, so what's the first thing we want to do is we, we learn to use a tokenizer. Uh, there are many tokenizer existing these days. Uh, you, can try, you can pick anyone you want to use. So basically what the tokenizer does is that it takes a string and it breaks it down to tokens. Um, tokens can be words. In this case, say the string is a sentence that says, my dog's my best friend. And you will break down to each word. Um, and actually, I, I Forgot to add here, but the period would be a separate token. So, so that will be a tokenizer. Uh, another possible tokenizer will be character level. So maybe M is a token, Y is a token, the space is a token. So it depends on how you want to, how you, you want your model to understand um, this string of data. You will pick a tokenizer that fits, fits this data and fits your, your goal. There are many. Uh, Tokenizers you can choose. There can be character level, which means you just have maybe 26 plus um, some, some you know, period and comma and, and space and a couple bit more, maybe 50 um, vocabulary size. And there's UTF-8, uh, Unicode, and the most prominent one right now people are using more, more very often is the what's called byte pairing coding. Um, basically, it starts from character level and try to merge characters together to become a token. So instead of having say um, M and Y, probably like my would be a token because it's used very often. So based on how frequently it is used in language, how frequently it is seen in language, uh, probably FR would be one token uh, because it's, it's appeared very, very often in, in different words and like TH, things like that. So it's some is byte pairing coding is kind of like a middle ground between character level and word level. Um, okay, so let's say we tokenized the string and let's just assume for simplicity here that we're using words as tokens. So now we're given a string, now we have a bunch of words, right? That's, that's, that's the job done by a tokenizer. Now what do I do? It's because machines still cannot understand words, words even as a token. So how do we represent words so that machine can understand it? Well, a very you know, direct sort of thought is that you can represent words as direct as discrete symbols. And in deep learning, you probably have seen uh, from the previous lectures that we love one hot vectors. We love representing discrete uh, things in, in one hot vectors. So for example, um, this is an example that people often use um, motel and hotel. 
there are two words they can be represented as one hot in you know, a one hot representation uh, where only one of the dimension is marked one and all the others are being zero so which dimension uh, it doesn't matter it depends on how you sort the whole vocabulary but say motel will be represented this way and hotel will be represented this way okay so i have a question here and for you to type in the chat so what do you think the dimension of this one hot vector is <laughs> 26 okay yeah that could be possible um, 1D, right, it is definitely 1D, but I'm asking, sorry, I'm asking the length of this dimension. Yes, size, uh, size of vocabulary, that's right. So thank you, Nathaniel. Um, the answer is that if the size of this one hot vector will be the number of words in your vocabulary. So for example, you can have, you know, a million. If I use character level um, representation, yeah, it could be 26. Uh, that's, that's how many letters you have. But let's say we're using word level. So this is a word. Um, and each word will be one token, then your so the size of this whole vector will be really large. Um, depends on your, your vocabulary size, but probably like 500,000 or a million. So that's kind of a problem, right? You don't want a representation to be so large and it seems wasteful that um, so many of them are zero. Uh, of course, if you're doing a neural network operation, the, when you're doing matrix multiplication, the zeros will go away but it just like takes a lot of space to even store them. So it seems like it seems wasteful. So a, a direct improvement from that. And also one thing that, that is um, being challenged here is that in such a representation, every two words are always orthogonal because they, you know, they only occupy sort of one dimension in this high dimensional space. So that means like motel, hotel would be entirely orthogonal, which shouldn't be the case because you sort of want them to be close because they, they mean, you know, similar things. You should, you should uh, you're supposed to um, have motel and hotel closer than say motel and dog. So a direct um, next thought would be maybe we represent them with word vectors. So before, I tell you like how to build word vectors and you know what are the methods of learning word vectors. Maybe we can just stop and think like if you are given word vectors, what do you want it to be like? What properties do you want the word vector to have? Well, first probably probably you want it to be dense just as opposed to one hot vector because otherwise you can just use one hot vector. You probably want to see you know some kind of like a shorter shorter um, uh, dimension, a shorter vector and a bunch of like flowed numbers because again you know neural networks love continuous numbers because they can do multiplication so just just like this is totally imaginary but if i were to build a word vector probably i would want to see something like this so you want it to be dense and you probably want it to be meaningful because why, why else are we building word vectors um as opposed to discrete symbols Meaningful in the sense that because they're vectors, now they exist in some high dimensional space and all the words exist in the same high dimensional space. So if you somehow project that space into a lower dimensional, say in this case, two dimensional space and you can visualize them because we have, we have difficulty visualize more than three dimensional. So let's say, say this word is represented by what this is like nine dimensions, but we project it into two dimensions and we project every word into the same two dimensional space and we visualize them probably you would want is that all the similar words or tokens, in this case it's words, um, like all those uh, about, about months, about numbers, years, um, all those things that have similar meanings are grouped together. So that would suggest that this is a meaningful space that you've constructed. You probably want that. Um, and another, another um, interpretation of meaningful is that you also, you've probably seen this in the news before that a proof that the word vector isn't really working is that they are, you can do math with it. So basically you can have king, uh, you can have king minus man, that would equal to queen minus woman or plus. So they have this vector uh, relationship in the, in, in the high dimensional space. The same, same thing. So the, from walking to walked should be the same relationship we got from swimming to swim. So if you minus walking from walked, or minus swimming from swim, they should they should match. They should be very similar. So when I say minus or plus is uh, in the linear algebra space. 
of course. So with high dimensional vectors, you can do that. Uh, so the math should make sense. And yeah, the, the projection should make sense. So that's the thing that you sort of want a word vector to have. So with that goal in mind, you can, you can, we can start learning how to make such word vector uh, possible. So one of the very prominent method out there, you probably have heard of, uh, because the, the, the name is very catchy, it's called word to vec It was invented uh, summer 2013, and it is a framework for learning such word vectors. There are many other frameworks out there, uh, but this one was quite successful. And it was quite easy. So there are two ways proposed in word to vec to learn such a vector. So let's, let's take a look at what they are. Um, so you can see that these two pictures are basically just a flip version of one another. So the first one is called continuous back and forth. Basically, you're trying to predict a center word by using the word in a small window of the center word, the neighboring words in a small window of the center word. Um, so why are we predicting words all of a sudden? So I thought we we're trying to build word vectors. Well, the things, if you want to learn anything, in this case, you want to learn a representation of words, you have to give it a test. Um, to learn that that's how just how machine learning works. You, they need a task, they need an objective function, they need uh, a loss function so that they can use gradients to learn things. So basically you're trying to come up with a smart task that by learning the task, they would automatically learn a representation that makes sense. And the representation in our case is we want a vector representation that has all the properties that we discussed earlier. So the task that WordVac came, came up with uh, is one of these tasks, whether you're either you are predict the center word from the neighboring word, or you do the other way around. You predict all the neighboring word from the center word. So one is called continuous back of words, the other is called skip grams. So it doesn't matter. They work, uh, I think, approximately similar. Um, just for simplicity, we're going to use skip gram. That is, you, you're predicting all the neighboring words with the center words to illustrate how word to back is trained. OK, let's say we're doing this. We are. For each center word, we're trying to predict all the neighboring words. Um, so <laughs> remember how I said that you have to sort of like think things in probabilistic terms. So this is like the first probabilistic equations we're going to come up with. I had a teacher in my grad school and who taught me that whenever you're teaching, whenever you're showing slide equations on a slide, make sure you make them really big. Uh, so that people can see it clearly and make sure you annotate them really well, tell them which, what each letter means and make sure to tell people that don't be afraid of the equation. It's just an equation. If you, are, if you fear them, they can probably smell your fear. So don't be afraid of them. Uh, be brave and they will in turn to feel for you. Uh, just some bad, funny as anecdote. So this equation seems a little bit intimidating, but it's okay. We can break it down. So now we're thinking of everything in probabilistic terms. So uh, I have this picture right here. You guys see my when the mouse move? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so we have the picture right here. That's our, this is the skip gram. That's what we're trying to do. We have, have a central word trying to predict um, the neighboring words. So what, what that means in the probabilistic term is that I want to have a probability given central word predicting neighboring words, right? So this is like exactly this with the theta because there has to be parameter that you want to learn because we're trying to build a loss function, objective function here. So that's what I want to do um, because there are more than one neighboring word. So in this case, the window is, window size is five. And you're not predicting yourself. So you're predicting four of your neighbors. So you just do um, a product of all the four probabilities. That's what you can do with probabilities. And you do the product within this, this window, M in this case is five, but you're omitting the zero, you're omitting yourself. So that's what it is. And you're learning not just for this single word, but you, you're learning for all the words in your database. So again, another product product of all the, all the possible um, T's. So T is going through the whole passage. Yeah, so that, that will give you a likelihood. So when you multiply a lot of probabilities together, each little probability is, a, is also called a likelihood. So we multiply them together, it comes to a likelihood of the whole sentence. So that's likelihood, we like likelihood. Uh, and normally in uh, maximum likelihood uh, construction or in, in making a model that's trained with ma maximum likelihood, the objective function, which is what we train with, uh, we train any parameters with, 
is usually just the negative log likelihood, what's called NLL. Um, so this is even simpler. So of course, again, it's intimidating, but it's a very simple conversion from this one. So what you simply did is that you take a log because we, we love logs in, in machine learning as well because um, it has nice properties and, and it works well with positive data um, as this probability is. So probability is, is always between zero and one. You take a log, you make it negative. Uh, if you remember the, the, the shape of a loss curve, but it keeps, it's monotonic. So if you have a big value here, a big value here. So the same, you just take a log and the amazing thing about log is that you convert all the product into a sum. So we like sums because when you're doing gradient descent, so with all the summing terms you can do, you can calculate gradient separately. So this is a very simple conversion. You add a log, uh, boom, you have a log here. You converted all the uh, product to a sum. And you simply like put an averaging term here because you, you want your loss to be within a bound. It's just easier to manage so that a longer sequence and a shorter sequence wouldn't be out of scale in terms of the loss they produce. So this will be the loss um, that you would want to optimize. Uh, you put a negative because you want to minimize the loss. Well, it's, it's the same, but in machine learning, you, you sort of are used to minimize uh, objective function as opposed to maximize, but it's just a choice that people made early on. It doesn't uh, change anything. You can easily maximize an objective, but let's say we are minimizing this ne negative log likelihood. So we're trying to train with this objective in mind. It's a loss. So you're trying to be minim you're trying to minimize it. If you're imagining how you train it, you would see, hope to see like a curve going down. So that's your loss. Cool, so it seems like I've got everything except for, wait, what, what is this P, right? We're just like saying that we want to model the probability of center word, uh, given center word of the neighboring word, but what is the P, should I be a model with it? So that's the, the one uh, remaining missing puzzle in this equation, what is the P, the probability? Well, here is like the, the in innovative part that we uh, people, uh, eventing word to vec came with came up with. So they designed two vectors for each word. So there's a vector V if it's a center word, and there's a vector U if it is a context word. So when you are a word in a passage, sometimes you're center because you are, you serve as when the T is at your place, you, you serve as the center word, you are the sort of predictor. Um, and sometimes you are a neighboring word of another center word. So that decides on, it depends, so that would decide which one of these vectors you would use. So each word has two vectors. And uh, the smart math that, that people inventing word to vec has came up with saying that the probability of a central word to predict, to predict a neighboring word or, so the probability given a context word to predict a, um, a, a center word, hmm, context word. The part of giving, sorry, so C means center because I, I mistake it as being context. They both start with C. So probability of center word, given center word, predicting the neighboring word or context word, which we use O for some reason. So this is the same as this that we're trying to model here. Um, e is gonna be the exponential of dot product, exponential block product, so, so this whole thing. It doesn't matter, right? This is something they designed and it worked. Uh, if you look at clo look closely, it makes a lot of sense. First, you have a dot products. So this is a very popular thing that people do in at least uh, recently in, in language modeling and in, in machine learning, people love dot product. It's a nice property that just tells you if you have two vectors, it just tells you how similar they are. The larger the value of the dot product, the larger the probability that they are similar. So it's a very nice measure of similarity. So that's why people love dot products. So you're doing a dot product of these two, two vectors. Um, uh, only, only remember that if you are the center word, you'll try to use V. So because um, that's, that's designed to represent center word. And if you're not a center word, you will try to use U. That's the only difference. So that's your similarity, but you sort of want the similarity to be bounded. Uh, like if I have a high similarity, if I have a high dot product, does that mean that I'm very similar to you? Or is that not high compared to everyone else's similarity? So uh, always when you're designing a measure, you want to normalize it. So this is a normalizing term, basically everyone else's similarity, right? Uh, and I sum them up, I 
I normalize with, uh, I normalize it, uh, I use it to normalize my similarity. Um, so this is a normalizing term. Again, very common thing you see in machine learning. They're also like, you're always trying to normalize things well. So they are within scale. Um, and exponential expo exponentiation is also something very popular, uh, popularly seen in, in machine learning. We like exponen expo exponentiating things because it makes everything positive. Um, uh, right, so so that's like the the simple three sim, three simple and very popular things um, put together in an equation and works really well. Okay, so now we have vectors. We are putting them in equation. We plug this into the objective function. Now we can start doing gradient descent. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of doing gradient descent, but you sort of get the idea that okay, now the theta is just all these. Um, oh. I wanted to ask a question. So what do we train here? What are the parameters? Uh, but I actually already told you the answer that is the theta that we were supposed to train that is objective function is dependent on are all, all these UW and VWs. So if you want to calculate the number of parameters in this model, because this word to vec is a model that you train, uh, it's going to be if you represent each vector as small d, your whole vocabulary is big V, then it's going to be d times V, but you also time two because you have U and W. And, and just a practical tip, in the end, when you use it, you just simply average U and W. So you separate them because it's easier to train uh, in practice, but when you use it later on after training, for each word, you probably just want one representation as opposed to two. So you simply average U and W after the training. Cool, so that's uh, how you train word to vac do, do you have any questions? I'm gonna stop here for, for questions. Hey, Roseanne, um, there are some questions in the chat. Um, I okay. can uh, read them. Um, uh, I can see the chat. Um, okay. So, okay. So one, yeah, one student is asking about what data represented in the equations. Um, I think it's just the, the parameters of the model. Yeah, I, I was not able to see the question. Can you say that again? Uh, um, what is what, the data representing in the oh, equations? Yeah, so that would be right. That that's the question that I was about to ask. So great, you're you're probably posting that question ahead of me. Uh, so after all these, I, I was going to ask, like, what do we train here? What's the theta? So the theta will be just the u, all the u and w's. It's, it's a lot of uh, sort of unintuitive because usually you think of theta as the parameters that are you know a small number of parameters. But remember, everything in deep learning is big, so it can have the whole vector, uh, everything. Everything in the equation is the theta, right? There's no other things. So basically, that this is a, a good model that all you train are parameters and there's no data or anything. So that's what you train. Cool. So uh, we have a couple of questions in Q&A. Mm -hmm. So uh, when is, uh, could you go over UW and VW in UW or VW? Mm, so um, yeah, so. <laughs> So basically, we, we basically like made, made the true vector for each word. Let's say you have a whole data that has lots of words. You know, my dog's my best friend. You just give my a u vector and v vector. You give dog a u vector, a v vector. Initially, you can initialize them to be all zeros or just random uh, or one hot, however you like. Um, probably not one hot because you want, you want a dense representation. You want the small d to not be the size of v. But like you initialize them, just say that, okay, now this is your vector. You are, you are the word dog, right? So now you're, you have two vectors. You're in charge of these two vectors. And I'm gonna train these two vectors as, as I go through the whole text, every time I see dog, or every time I see dog as a central word or as a neighboring word to some, someone else, I'm gonna update your vector. So in the end of training, after you go through the whole text, maybe a few times, you're gonna have those two parameters of that word updated. And the end, what we, what we obtain out of this method is that each word now in your vocabulary has two vectors. A vector can be, you know, of the size 300 or something. That's what people like to use. But that's, that's what uh, UW and VW here is. We have a, we have a good question in the, in the chat. How does this method deal with homonyms? Um, 
Uh, it's in Q&A. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's in the, it, if you click on Q&A in the bottom bar, it'll pop mm. up more questions. Um, how does this method do as well? Like the, hom the math? Hom homonyms, homonyms. Um, so if something is spelled the same way, but has different meanings. Um, yeah, it, it does not. It does not uh, have a way to deal with that. So that's, that's the thing, uh, this lim limitation of word vac, it does not also um, disambiguate word senses. Like if you have the same word, but it means differently, you're gonna have the same vector built because, just because of how it is spelled that way. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. And that's the, the, the challenge that word vac would not solve. And of course later, uh, spoiler alert, it's gonna be solved by by BERT and or context aware representations, but WOTOVAC is going to be purely based on how it is spelled um, or how it is tokenized. If you if you make bank a token, um, and even though bank have many meanings, it can be the place that you draw withdraw money from. It can be a river bank, um, but because it's spelled like that and it's made one token, it's going to have one representation. So yeah, it's probably um, the average of both of its meanings or more than one meanings. But that's a good question. Um, we have one more question in the Q&A and then a raised hand. Do you have a preference? Yeah. Get two more. Um, depends on when you want to get back to the lecture. Oh yeah, sure. So I can see the question saying, since we are using the surrounding words to create some weighted flow representation we came across different size sentences, wouldn't each word have a limit to how many surrounding words we could use to determine its meaning? Different size sentences. Um, yeah, so that's a design choice that you make up front. So you maybe want to say, I want my window size. So that's like a window size decision uh, hyperparameter. Maybe I want my window size to be five because it makes sense because all this within the whole context, uh, the whole text database data that I have, seems like any sentence is at least five long. But of course, you would come up with, you know, you, you encounter a sentence that has only two words, then you would be a problem. Um, but that's, there's a simple workaround that you just mask the remaining three as zero and it doesn't affect the learning because if they're all zero, uh, everything is zero, the gradient is zero. So those, them being zero wouldn't affect the training. So there are like easy tricks you can do after you make a decision of how big your window is. But uh, the decision of how big of a window you want to use should be like sort of informed by what kind of data you have. So if you, all your data is like two word sentences, you probably don't want to use a five window, a five as a window size. But yeah, that's a great question. Uh, whoever's raised hand, uh, feel free to speak. Hi, uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, I just had a question for natural language processing as well. Sorry. I Sorry, apologies. I accidentally turned off your ability to speak. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, um, you also have a background music, which is amazing. Okay. Sorry yeah. about that. Um, I'll make it quick so the music doesn't deter. Um, <laughs> okay. But I had a question for NLP as a whole. Do you know of any people who are trying to kind of widen the scope of it in terms of having it work for other languages? Or is it kind of strictly right now an English forward mm -hmm. endeavor. Yeah. Because I can see how bias will come in with this in the future. Yeah. But then since English is such a big language, which doesn't mean that, you know, it shouldn't be tried to, you know, implement other languages with it. But what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that right now um, there's, is the bias something that's, you know, detrimental or does it really matter I don't know if the grand scheme is the correct terminology for it, but for what's trying to be accomplished, maybe at least for you or just for the for the collective, if you will. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. That's sense. that's a, that's an awesome question. Thank you so much. I can't uh, see your name, so, so sorry I didn't. Uh, oh, Mina. See your name. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's an awesome question. Um, that's like this is a question really just um, for any field, right? Any field, you sort of start with something and, and everyone, if one person started that field with that thing, everyone's gonna come in and trying to directly, naturally work on that thing. So yeah, English um, in NLP is very prominent, almost, you know, I don't know, I don't have the exact number, but I would say like 85% of energy of researchers are put in trying to understand English. 
uh, that can be changed by just having more researchers out there speaking different languages. So that's why, again, diversity of the field is important. Again, why I'm, 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 I am building up my whole career around trying to increase diversity of the field. Yeah, it's the same bias we see also in face recognition. You know, more data came from white male. So the system learned to just recognize white male much better than colored persons. Uh, right. And English is the same. Yeah, language model is more successful in, in English probably in than in any other language um, other than probably Chinese because you also have a lot of researchers speaking Chinese and trying to build Chinese language models. Um, and in the end it's like who has the most researchers, who has the most resources, um, will try to develop models in, in that little domain. So yeah, this is definitely a problem to be aware of. There are many great efforts um, that I, I've seen have come across trying to, you know, um, direct people's energy and people's attention to less spoken languages like African languages. There are great initiatives doing that. Um, definitely check it out out there. Um, Sebastian Ruder, um, someone that, that um, <laughs> my friend is, is like sort of aware of a lot of those initiatives and he's of course a very well-known figure in NLP. So those people are very being very supportive of those initiatives. But yeah, uh, this is an existing problem. We've definitely seen it there are different initiatives trying to solve it, but we're definitely not there that we're being fair to all the other spoken or written languages out there. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Um, okay, so I saw another question. Maybe I'll try to get to this one before we move on. <clears throat> How does a model able to classify, interpret, and differentiate between context word and center word? That's a great question. So the whole thing is um, that throughout the training, let me go back to this. Throughout training, every word gets to be a center word and neighbor word because you're basically just scanning over the whole corpus of your text. So that's how the whole training works. Um, so here I'm only showing a snippet, right? You are, this, this could be my dog is my best friend. So is becomes a center word, but as you're scanning, so the window like moves across the whole text, uh, the, the word dog would get to be someone else's neighbor and get to be the center uh, and get to, get to be the neighbor of many different words. They all have a chance to do that. So that's why the both of the vectors, center word vector and context word vector are being trained. That's an excellent question. Cool, I think um, I'm gonna move on. So let's say we, we train that, right? It seems like uh, we, we've got a, whoops, we've got an objective function, uh, gradient should just work uh, nicely because uh, across the whole equation, there's no nowhere we break continuity, nowhere we break differentiability. So gradient should work nicely. Um, gradient descent will help you train this vector. And uh, it is very successful. It is a very successful method. In the end, after training, there's a site that you can basically play with a pre-trained word, word vac with a lot of words. And you can see that they nicely cluster together from different notions. Um, and you can easily query a word and find the most similar word to that query word. And it makes um, perfect sense. So that's like sort of ways to validate that you've trained, you've obtained a good representation of the words. They cluster together well the you know, similarity sort of matches. Um, there are different like ways to explore this word to back explorer, different ways to explore different um, spaces in the whole dimension, high dimensional space. Uh, I think I saw a question early on in a chat asking how to project into a lower dimensional space. There are many ways uh, you can do PCA. The very um, popular way these days is called TSNI. Uh, but basically it's just some simple math to project the higher dimension to a lower dimension and try to pick the low dimension to be the most you know, determining one. But, but here, yeah, whenever you're viewing something in two dimensional, remember that it was existing in a higher dimension, it is projected here. So uh, based on the method of projection, sometimes it would not make that much sense. So sometimes you would try to make, um, run it a few more times if you're doing Tisney until you probably find a very successful, very, um, sensible direction. So yeah, in this visualization, you can see that things also make sense. You know, they're close together. Uh, if you're one word is only, it's just a plural of the other and it seems like the direction also sort of matches. I'm not sure, not sure if exactly um, they're close, right? From this one, so it seems the other way though. Yeah, well, the, the whole model is trying to, to learn many, many things. So we just spotted maybe a little bit imperfection here. So from banana to bananas is this 
upward direction, but then from pineapple to pineapple is, is going the opposite direction. Kind of interesting. Cool. Um, with that, I will sort of like that's it with the word to back section or learning word vector section. So are we there? We have we just send, spend enormous effort trying to learn word vectors. Now with each word, we can have a, a condensed representation of it. So are we there? So far we figured out how to represent the very basic unit in NLP, that's words. And after the whole learning, we probably got ourselves a huge matrix that is of a million, say that's your vocabulary size, times 300, say that's your dense representation size. You got yourself a huge matrix. You basically, it's a whole big lookup table. Now with any word, you can find a 300 sized vector to represent it. But is that it? Um, there's some problem with it. It is a static representation, meaning that it is trained, it is fixed, it is there. It doesn't adapt itself. So as the few questions that you guys raised, um, if it's a homonym, uh, if it's the word, that has many senses or many meanings, it won't be able to differentiate that. Also, it doesn't adapt. If like 100 years later, this word now means slightly different from before, this representation will be outdated and you have to retrain it. So it doesn't adapt with the context with how it's being used with even time. So kind of problematic. And, and at the end, we are just right now just figuring out how to represent word, but what about the rest of language? language is much more than just a collection of words. There's a structure, there's how you say things. Even for the same set of words, if you rearrange it differently, probably you know you would be saying very different things. So what about all the rest of it? Um, how should we model that? Because to be able to produce or understanding or do anything with language, you should be thinking about modeling all the rest in, on top of the words. So, so what I'll say here is that word vectors is a very good start, basically by converting words into um, a dense representation or a numeric representation, it now, it now allows any practitioners to start building models. So with computer vision, we come, it's easy. So the data come to us with RGB values, we can already start building models on top of it. So now we've spent all the time just to convert each word into basically like an RGB-like representation, but now uh, you can start building any models with it. Like you've probably learned con convolutional neural networks, you can try doing that. You can try all kinds of model act architectures. So the, here is where the fun starts, because now we have representation, you can really just stack layers on top of them and try to design loss functions for your specific task. But uh, what models and what tasks? So later of the lecture, this part of the lecture will, will we go over like a few possible models that you can build with this representation and some tasks you can think about um, doing if you're trying to work in NLP. So one stark sort of difference of NLP versus the other field is that it has a lot of tasks. So if you think about your, your learning language. There are just so many things you can do with language. You can try to model a language. That is, you're trying to um, have a generator that speaks, that generates language as a human would. And there's translation. You, you can work with you know, more than one language and try to find one one mappings of each other. There's question answering. There's conversational AI that's building a bot that speaks with, to you. Um, there are many things. There's sentiment analysis. You have a passage. Trying to, trying to decide whether it's a positive passage or negative passage. Say if it's a movie review, um, you, can, you can try to have a machine read that and tell you whether this person thinks highly of the movie or, or you know, bad of the movie. There are many, many things you can do with language. Actually, because there are so many things <laughs> and there are, there are sort of like benchmarks people put together, um, it's called glue. And later on, there's a more advanced version called super glue. The website is here. Basically, it has all these tasks in, in this benchmark site. And anyone proposing a model would try to use the model to test it on all these tasks and report scores or metrics on all these tasks. So just in some way, like it's sort of like harder to propose a model in NLP because like you have to really be good at all these tasks, even if you're just trying to get ahead with glue, there's this many tasks. Uh, not to mention if you're trying to get ahead with glue and super glue, um, as opposed to maybe if you're working in computer vision, you can just have a model that's great at image classi classification, have a model that's great at producing top point accuracy on ImageNet and you're done. That's a paper. 
Uh, but sort of like the trend that we're seeing is that any NLP model, they have to be validated with a lot more tasks than vision tasks. Uh, but the good news there, I think that most of tasks are similar, at least of all the recent models that we've seen proposed, um, they pretty much you know, perform similarly well or unwell on across all the tasks. Although they're very different, some are uh, about reading comprehension and some are about ask, uh, asking, answering some questions, multi, multi um, choices of questions, for example. But yeah, but that would be like what you would want to do if you're working in an LP trying to um, get to know all these tasks and try to have your model sort of like perform well in each of them. Uh, speaking of super glue, which is uh, the more recent, more advanced um, task collection, uh, for, for both of the sides, there are leaderboards and the same for super glue. There's a leaderboard basically just like ranks. You can submit your model to the site and it will calculate all the scores based on all the, the various tasks combined together, uh, showing you how well your model is performing. Um, we will stop here for a second and tell me like what you see in this, in, in this picture. What you see that is surprising or unsurprising, um, just what you see here. I'll be observing the chat. You can type in the chat if you want. And, and by the way, this just happened, at, I believe, a few days ago. It was not like this uh, a few days ago. <laughs> a lot of Roberta. Yep, that's true. Um, but the really thing here is that human baseline is here. So when they started this leaderboard, they established a human baseline. They probably, I don't know, but like ask a few, a few humans to perform the tasks themselves and give, make their scores here. And for the longest time, um, no models, no AI models were able to beat human baseline. Uh, I think I could be wrong, but I think this just happened a few days ago that number one and two are now models instead of human baseline. Um, kind of uh, a very important moment in human history, I guess, or at least in this small domain of tasks that um, we have machine there outperforming human in terms of all these tasks, understanding language and doing all the things with it. Um, I don't know, it can be surprising or not surprising after you've seen so many news about machines beating human at you know chess and Dota and probably it's not super surprising that they're beating us at language. But at the same time, sort of like language is a thing that we have, right? It's not math, it's not, you can't do it with calculation. So I don't know, uh, depends on uh, how, where you stand, you probably have different emotional reacts to it. But uh, yeah, that's the thing that I was trying to allude to. Cool. Um, so we have all these tasks, like hundreds of them, thousands of them. Uh, I want to focus on part of this lecture on one task that's um, sort of like, you, you've probably seen it a lot. It's called language modeling and it's making a lot of progress. And also it's a, it's a task that's really simple. You're just trying to produce language. It's like in GANs, you're trying to paint a picture. Uh, and that says a lot of our model. If a model can produce language, that's just, you know, represents sort of a base understanding maybe of that model of language. And all the GB2, GB3 models that we've seen out there belong to this task. They're trained basically to do language modeling. It's a very simple objective. That is um, to predict the next word. So language modeling is the task of predicting what word comes next. <clears throat> if you want to write in math, again, don't be intimidated by the math. It's just you know symbols, same as the natural language. So this is the same, the same thing again, but in math. Say if you have a sequence from you uh, x1 to xt, that's how long your sequence is. Those are the words or tokens. Uh, basically, you want to predict what the next word is, meaning you want to have a probability representation. Again, probability really comes heavily in, in NLP of the next word given all the previous words. So that's what you're trying to do in language modeling if you're trying to speak in math. Um, yeah, that means a text generator. If you are training it well, you should have a text generator. You have a model that knows what's the most probable words after, then you can generate that word and then you put that word back into um, this conditional uh, term, then you can generate the next word. So you can keep going and that's how all the advanced language models these days are working. Cool. Um, so it is a text generator, but also at the same time, it is also a model that assigns probability to a piece of task. Why do I say that? Uh, basically what I mean is, 
it is a model that can give you this probability, conditional probability, but it's also a model that can give you a joint probability. So this just basically saying that what's the probability of this sentence? Say, my dog is my best friend. Is this a probability of like 95% or 20%? Whatever that means, right? Of course, people have debates over like, what does it mean if you say how likely or how probable is this sentence? But let's say we have a diff definition on that. And this is a model that's able to tell you that. This is how probable, how likely this sentence is to be seen, like maybe in the wild world or uh, how often or how likely you're gonna hear the sentence, basically like that. So this will be a model that's able to give you that um, because you can do it in with the simple math um, because if you are following this Markov um, assumption that each word's probability is only given by its previous words, then this joint probability is basically just a, a multiplication of all the word probability of from word one to word two to word T and of course, except for word one, all the other words are conditioned on their previous words, but basically it's a multiplication of all of them. Um, or in a very more concise representation is a you know, product of all of them. This is the same as this one. It's just you know, written in a more concise form. And see, our model is able to give you that. So that's why our model is able to give you this joint probability. So that's basically explanation why it is a text generator, but also at the same time, a like probability assigner, whatever you want to call it, but like it evaluates how likely your sentence is. Um, also, this <clears throat> just, just so you know, it's also called an n-gram, or in this case a t-gram because the, the lens is t. Um, before deep learning, almost all language models are generated or are built with an n-gram. So n-gram just basically says if I have n tokens in a sentence. Uh, I want to know the probability of that sentence. So that's your n-gram. And, and I, I should have probability of any phrase or combination that has n length. So it was a very sort of like brute force method to, for language modeling back in the days. You just have a huge table that documents you know, everything you see in this corpus was the, the like three gram of everything, every possible three word combination I want to count how many times they appeared over you know, all the number of times any uh, three word combination appeared. So you have a probability and you use that simply as a word generator. That's, what, that's the very, one of the very earliest and very basic um, language model back in the days, just so you know. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so with that, we, we sort of like, we sort of know that language model basically existed from way before, right? Around maybe 1950s, we already have Ngram. It's very, again, it's like not really a machine learning model. You just count the frequency, the occur occurrence of all the uh, n grams, in, the, in this case, maybe three grams, based on this Markov assumption. And you build a huge uh, database. And then when you generate, you sort of draw from that database because you have probability, you can pick the most probable word next. So back then with n gram, you're basically, you're able to generate sentence like this, which sort of like is already very impressive. Uh, given how easy this model is. Uh, so they were able to generate samples like they also point to $99.6 billion for 204063% of the rates of interest stories as Mexico and Brazil on market conditions. Sort of like doesn't make much sense, but it's sort of fluent and it could be, you know, something that you see in the internet. That's, that's the point. So it's like, it's pretty impressive with uh, such a simple model, but that's the 1950s. Moving forward to 2011, which is like sort of like people are starting to work on RNNs and, and uh, language models again because of the like um, renewed interest in machine learning and in neural networks. Um, and an RNN back in 2011 was able to do this. So if you give it a prefix or sort of like a condition, you write this, the meaning of life is, and then you ask the machine, please complete the sentence for me. And it will say that like, meaning of life is the tradition of the ancient human reproduction is less favorable to the good boy for when to remove her. So I'm like, some, somehow it doesn't, you know, starts to lose uh, sense as you go on. That's also usually a thing you see in language modeling that in the beginning, the sampling is pretty well because this, this condition is well put, right? Human write this condition. So this word would make the most sense. But the second word will be conditioned on, oops, sorry, will be conditioned on the human input and the last generation. So as you go on and on, you're just like basically feeding your own pre pre produced language back to your condition 
uh, sort of just like diverges really fast. So that's back then. Um, in 2016, people start building larger RNNs and a better variant of RNN called LSTMs. And you're able to you know, generate basically better language with it. Um, moving forward, like a few years later, uh, people invented transformer, uh, which we're, we're gonna be looking at later on. And this is a character level transformer that people build and is, is you know, becoming more, definitely more um, impressive than previous results. And remember, this is a character-based model. So the model generates each word, each, sorry, each letter one after another. So the, the fact that it's able to spell really well for almost every word, there's no you know, misspelling that you can see is really impressive. But that's a transformer, so it's a better model. Um, you can build bigger transformers. I, I'm, um, I'm sure this is uh, trans, what's called Transformer XL. So with bigger transformers, you can have better samples. Basically, that's you know the thing that we already know. We want to make a model bigger and bigger. We want to make use more and more data. And this is uh, the GBD2H <laughs> that uh, in 2019 we're able to, or uh, people out there are able to train a language model that's called GBD2 that's giving you really basically amazing stories. So you give, you give it a prefix. Basically, it's, it's just a made up story, right? In the prefix, you want, it to, you want the model to finish the story um, starting with that scientists discovered unicorn and they spoke perfect English and they discovered a uniform in the Andes mountains. So the model is able to sort of like finish telling the story even though it started from really a nonsensical start but telling it in a very you know, believable way and very, very interestingly is able to you know, make connections to what's said in the prefix. For example, the prefix mentioned scientist. So you are trying to put you know, doctor um, in, in the sentence, um, evolutionary biologist, sort of like drawing from scientists. And in the prefix, there's Andes Mountains uh, is able to um, make reference to that by saying University of La Paz, which, which I believe is a city next to Andes Mountains. So sort of like this is amazingly believable um, and amazingly able to accumulate all the knowledge basically out there in the wild that some humans may not be able to possess. So that's like the moment uh, of GPT-2 that people are really amazed by the capability of language models. So we've just gone through um, a few samples. We were looking at samples to, to judge like how well trans, uh, sorry, language modeling have been through over the years from you know, early 1950s to basically now-ish. Uh, of course, I haven't shown GB3 results, but I'm sure some of you have played with and, and it's just, um, again, very, very impressive and basically it can definitely pass the Turing task and, and um, pass you as, as a human speaking. So if we've seen that, uh, we are gonna spend a little bit of time to see what the model is like. So we've probably seen, we've seen text samples from transformers and I told you that this is an RNN, this is LSTM, but what are they, right? So we're gonna look at it like very, very briefly what they are in terms of models. Uh, let me check with time. So I think we're, we're pretty good with time. <clears throat> yeah, Roseanne, um, we're supposed yeah. to finish at 11.30, but we can go over a little bit, like 15 minutes. Um, oh, yeah. cool, cool. Also, I'm happy to, um, yeah, uh, go faster or slower. <clears throat> um, so there's a question in the chat asking the test is completely made up by the model, yes. Uh, that's, that is true. So it is a model, it is a language generator. Anything you see here is made up by the model except for the underlined one is typed in by human. So human is basically asking the model to you know, complete the story after this period. Um, read all these and then start writing yourself uh, until you're happy to, until you're comfortable to stop. So yeah, that's how impressive this model is. Basically all written by AI. A model, a big transformer. Do we have any other questions? Cool. Uh, there's a raised hand. Hmm. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a question I had on, on the chat. Also, is I I wanted to know like uh, you said that you pretty words based on like the words that are around it or come before it. So I, want, I wondered what about like if it's the, it's the first word or the start of the sentence. So, and then you have no previous data or words to predict from. So how, how basically mm -hmm. do you, the models learn from that? 
Yeah, so uh, again, so any model is sort of a have a context lens it, um, that you set up front. So you're telling the model that you're able to look back, you know, a hundred words or something like that. Uh, but with transformers, you're able to, so with, with our lens, that, that lens is unlimited because you just see, we're going to see how the model works and to know that our lens, they just pro pro process word one after another, basically it sees every word that has ever gone through in, in, in this generation of this passage. Uh, but with transformer, it also sees almost everything up to a limit that you set and is able to pay different attentions to different words. But basically, yes, um, any the generation here probably like already sees everything uh, even more before it if you were, were to type more before it. I hope, hope that answers the question. Yeah, and a quick other one is, uh, you always been said like, like, let's say like tones, expression and like double meaning, it's pretty hard to translate to text. So I wonder in like mm -hmm. conversational AI, how does it like interpret those things, which is pretty hard in text. Like let's say you're sending a text, it's pretty hard to get the tone and all those other meaning that it's like not shown in conversations. Yeah, uh, it's hard, <laughs> um, but um, at least like recent development has shown you that it was enough data. So if you have enough variety in your data that has different tones, and if there are people there annotating the tones and like creating subtasks for the model to learn. So the model, the language model basically just learns to produce the next word. But if at the same time, you're also telling the model have a separate head, what, what people call uh, in, in the model to basically classify the tone or at least let it be aware of the tone. Um, trained with that method, sometimes the model will be more aware of the tone and uh, respond in, you know, according to the tone. But yeah, it's a very hard problem. It's an ongoing research. If you're interested in research, definitely, you know, you can start doing it because no one has really completely solved it yet. That's a great question. Yeah, thank you. Cool, let's, um, we've seen some samples and you've uh, heard words like RNN, LSTM and transformer in those samples. So now let's just look at you know, what they are. Um, so before we go to RNN, so basically why do we need RNN? So the first question probably comes to mind is like, can we just model with CNNs? Because we already learned CNN if you uh, attended last lecture. That seems like it's able to process a sequence, right? So why don't we just try using CNN because we wanna know why we would need an RNN. So yeah, you can totally use a CNN. And how CNN pr process a language would be like this. So again, you put um, language comes in as tokens. So say for each word, you, you just lay them out like this. And um, because we already did the word to vac um, things. So now each word is represented by a vector. So I use this like box, long box representing a vector. It's just like a string of, uh, numbers. So now great, each word is represented like this. You remember how convolution works? A convolution is a window that scans over the whole space. Usually when you do um, image, you would have a 2D window by like three by three or five by five. But because word exists in a 1D sort of dimension, if you're not uh, <clears throat> accounting for this 300 in this dimension, so you would have a 1D, RNN, so 1D CNN, that's what you have. So in this illustration, um, using a window size of four. So we have one times four, the window size, and you have the window go through the whole text. For each four words, you're gonna have a representation. Uh, next to four words, you have a representation. So this is just a common, <coughs> excuse me, common CNN that you would build. And in the end, you summarize everything into a one representation, which say represents the, sen the sentiment of the sentence, something like that. It's harder to use CNN to do language modeling, but it's not impossible. Basically, what you do is you, pay, you pick the next word that's after this, this the, the, the last blue uh, word that you see, and you use that, use that as your objective. So it can be a language model in that sense. Uh, it's sort of harder, but yeah, for various reasons. But yeah, of course, you can use CNN already. You don't need to learn any fancy new model. You can already start producing, uh, processing text with a model that you're very um, familiar with. So yes, but uh, of course there are limitations of it. That's why we, we want to come up with new models. So the limitation here is that it's a fixed length input. So one thing that you probably know with CNN is that um, everything comes in has to be the same size. 
with image, it's easy. You can basically just resize every image into the same size, say like to do four by to do four without losing much information. Of course, you, if you downsize an image, it's blurrier or it, um, some information is lost, but it's like sort of okay. And that's what people do when they um, build a model on top of ImageNet. The first thing they do is they convert each ImageNet image into the same size, say to do four by to do four. But with language, you can't really do that. If you, you know, sub-sample languages, you're totally, you're per, totally breaking the language apart and uh, it's not learning the right thing. So really we, we need a neural network that can process any lens input and be okay with it. So that's how uh, Recurrent basically came around. So Recurrent is a, is a structure that is able to take inputs recurrently, which is why it's called Recurrent. Uh, you can consider it a regular neural network on road in time. I'll explain what that means. So you, you have the same series of words, right? But then every time only one word goes in, uh, as a neural network would do, it converts that word into a hidden state. Uh, we call hidden state, but basically it's, there's a layer of, um, there's a layer in the neural network that converted to something else. Maybe uh, I plot this longer because usually the hidden state is bigger than the original input. So you have a hidden state, you just do this. So this, this one line here is just a very normal feed for neural network. It can be an NLP, right? It can be convolution, whatever you want. But then what comes after it is that you put another word in, at the same time you put the last hidden state in. So now it's the same neural network. You are using it another time. So if you're trying to program it, you can imagine a for loop, right? You first process this word. Now you're processing a second word, but using the same parameters, same same um, model, uh, and you're feeding the, the hidden state you got from last time into it. So each time it takes two inputs, one from your word, the other from your previous state. So you might ask like, what do I do here? Here seems like I just have one input, that's the word. Well, usually you would have a hidden state that is H0. Uh, I didn't uh, plot it here, but, but yeah, you would have an input. It can be initialized as all zero or just random. It will learn uh, to to be more and more sensible. So you do this for every uh, time step until you reach the, the end of the sentence I want to process. So this is very nice because you know it doesn't matter how long your sentence is. And one important thing here is that the weights are tied, meaning like every time you use this model, you're, you're using the exact same weights as before. Because if it's untied, if it's all different, then it again cannot adapt to any lens. Only because it's the same model, you keep using it, using it um, you're basically like unrolling the same model over time. That's why we say unrolled in time. Um, so that's how a recurrent neural network works. Um, any questions on how it works before we, I, I move on to pros and cons of it? Cool. Um, yeah, sort of easy. Um, you just like look at one word per time. Seems like makes sense, right? We when we hear a speech or we read a text, probably we also read one word after another. Um, so the pros of this model is that it can process any length input, great. And any however your however long your your sequence your input is, it comes comes up with in the end like one fixed length representation. So that's very useful. You can sort of like learn to read the whole sentence and come up with uh, always like a I don't know, a thousand lens uh, vector that represent all the knowledge you've learned with the whole sentence. So it's very easy to build um, downstream models with that. So you can try to map this representation with any MLP into say um, a topic modeling model or a sentiment classifier without having to think that, oh, if that input sentence was longer, do I have to make the classifier size differently? No, because any lens of the input, you always come up with, you know, a thousand. So you can start building your MLP with like a thousand by two thousand, two thousand by three thousand. You know, you can design a model right away without caring about uh, what's the output length. It is supposedly able to capture long-term memory because you basically read every word. The same model, you know, read every word. It, there's no window length. It's not saying that any word outside of the window of 100, I would not be able to read because it, the way that it works is that you read every word from beginning to end. Uh, there are um, disadvantages that is sort of slow because you can't really parallelize over time. Um, so time two has to come after time one. So the unrolling in time um, is a blessing, but at the same time a curse because now you cannot uh, 
speed up uh, better than 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 you know process all the time at the same time. So that's slow. And although we say that long term memory is sort of uh, a given, but people have found out that it only works in theory. Like in theoret theoretically, you should be able to remember things from very early on. But what we found is that as you go further and further in time, they start to sort of forget what's said in the beginning, which makes sense, right? If you're a human, you keep reading after, I don't know, 200 pages, you probably forgot what the first page is about if you're asked a question about the first page. So it makes sense. Uh, there's also practical problems, what's called vanishing gradients, because um, practically what this is, is a super deep, if you're, you're unrolling in time, say for a hundred steps, it's basically a hundred step is a hundred deep um, neural network. And we probably already know that there are vanishing gradients problem in deep neural networks. People were not able to make networks very deep due to that. And a lot of like workarounds had to be proposed like ResNet was, was proposed and all, all of like DenseNet was proposed to basically counter the vanishing gradient problem. But with recurrent network, this problem is basically just inherent because how you unroll it, it you, you're building really, really deep neural network and where all the ways are tied. Um, it's very hard to train, basically. So, um, which is why people came up with fancier architectures to solve, try to solve all those problems. It never solved the problem of slow because uh, as long as it stays within the family of recurrent neural networks, it still have to process word one after another. But uh, basically LSTM, and GRUs are proposed to, to solve the task of forgetting uh, context from early on. Um, and LSTM was really a very popular invention uh, with that, I think basically by the time they was invented, basically just um, wiped away like all the benchmarks that used to be achieved by RNN. So it become the, the most favored child in the RNN family. So um, there are many blog posts analyzing what each gate means. I won't go deep into it. Basically, like you still have a one X come in and one H comes out. Uh, so this is O, this is an H. So you have one X come in, one H come out and possibly one also output comes out. And basically instead of just map it with just one layer, um, they create all these gates. So you can have a forget gate. So you can decide whether this is an input that I would want to forget or this is an input that I want to uh, save in memory. It adds memory to, to basically the, the layer. So it's more, it's like sort of rather complicated, but with this complicated design, you're able to overcome the vanishing gradient and the long-term memory thing, problem. Um, that's why like anytime you, you, find, you find a model that's sort of like underperforming, you, as a researcher, you should think that, oh, there's a chance for me or for some other researcher in the field to propose better models. So never get disappointed just because your model is not working. See, it always like a failure of your model has a chance to propose better models. So this will be a great example. So all those variants, those fancy RNNs basically dominate the field until around 2018, uh, until we probably, you guys probably know, Transformer came about. So. So how the way that I want to explain transformer, of course, I want to compare it with CNNs and RNNs. So a recap of how CNNs work. You probably remember it, like a moving window scanning the whole sequence versus looking, um, taking in input one at a time. And transformers, or in this case, uh, this is just a part of the transformer that's called self-attention, really is a new member of the family. So now you can go out and tell people that there are three types of model you can build. Um, three families of model you can build. You can build a CNN, you can build an RNN, you can build a self-attention. And almost all the three models are applicable to almost all kinds of problems. You know, CNNs work well in computer vision, but you can also use RNN in computer vision. It just doesn't make that much sense, but it's able to take, you know, one pixel after another and in the end make decisions. Uh, you can also use CNN for sequence that we have seen. So self-attention is the same. You can use it basically for any application because it is the same. You process a bunch of inputs and come up with an output. And the whole thing is trainable because everything, every operation is differentiable. Um, so without going into super details, what, what self-attention is, is that you can see that it's more complicated a mechanism than all these. So these basically whenever I just put a, a direct arrow, it just means that it's a simple mat mill, um, matrix multiplication. But here is more complicated than matrix multiplication. 
And first thing, thing you will notice is that it allows this like pairwise computation early on. So for all the other models, basically if you are an input, you just go ahead, do your own thing. You never interact with the rest of your peers, you know, the other words basically. But then with self-attention from early on, you're asked, so the operation asks you to compare yourself with your peer with, with other words. So this compare is a function that you can use anything and, and is a dot product actually. So that we've seen before, it's a very favored operation that machine learning researchers just love. So let's say you compare yourself with, um, with the word before you, you compare yourself with the word after you, you can compare as much as you want. Actually, what people do is they compare with everything. So it's a pairwise comparison you can do. And after the comparison or the similarity calculation, because it's a dot product, you come up with a number that you can say, okay, how similar I am to this word, how similar I am to this word. That's a measure that I sort of have in mind. And then I multiply their representation by the similarity. So this is a multiplication. Uh, so I'm sort of like taking part of their representation just because I'm similar or not similar to them and then add it to my representation. So, so this whole uh, process is very beautiful and makes a lot of sense that I'm building my representation, not just based on my previous representation. That's all the previous models are based on that. My later representation is based on my previous representation. But here is my later representation is based on my previous representation and everyone else's previous representation. So it's a very beautiful design, makes a lot of sense. Um, totally changed the field with this, uh, this, this simple change of, of the architecture. And amazing thing is that, so I already talked about it allows early pairwise interaction. Um, it is multiplicative. So that's also one thing that is able to change. That is like, there's a multiplication here. So if you recall all the other models, there's no multiplication of activations. So you, of course, every process, you multiply yourself to the weights, but this is the one architecture that allows a multiplication of activations. So after you, so this is your input, after your comparison, this is an activation. You're basically multiplying two activations together and come up with something. So it allows the multiplication um, to exist in the model. That's probably like one of the reasons that is successful. It is permutation invariant because you're doing pairwise computation. You don't know this word is before you. You just know that it's a word out there that you want to compare to. Um, it is both a feature and sort of a bug. So later on people pro uh, proposed positional encoding to overcome that. So, cause they want the model to still know like what's, where it is in, in this sentence. So, but this is a feature of self-intention. It doesn't know where each word is. Basically it sees each, uh, all the words as a collection, like a bag of words. It is very parallelizable because the same thing you do with this word, you're doing with other word, we're doing with this word. It doesn't depend on like this word has to be processed before me or something. So it's totally parallelizable. That's amazing. Allows you to train a faster and faster models. And as we see later on that basically all the great success stories out there with um, big models, is just the ability to train with large data and train really fast. And also it makes intuitive sense if you think about it, like, of course, when I read this word, I kind of want to know like whether it is referring to any other words, like the, the attention, the idea of attention that is paying to the other words makes intuitive sense to us. Uh, and you can easily visualize the attention because it is an actual attention. There's a number that you can uh, come up here. So this, after the comparison, there's a number. So you can visualize it and also the authors of the paper uh, that's called attention is all you need, uh, provided a notebook that you can just play with attention. So for this sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Um, so this it is paying attention to every other word and you can see that it is paying more attention to animal. So it knows that this it is an animal and its state like too tired is also paid more, more attention. So it makes the model very interpretable, at least more interpretable than any previous models. That's also a very nice feature of uh, self-attention. So self-attention is basically the very important building block of what we know later as transformer. So transformer is basically self-attention but making it more complicated. Now you have multi-head attention kind of here. And they add a bunch of like normalization, uh, residual connection, which is like here and a feed for network and all of other things. So when you're in the space of designing a model, you're, you're, this is like a Lego game. You're putting all the pieces together and try to see which one works. But so they tested 
this um, Lego piece and it worked really, really well. And it is uh, proposed, of course, in, in this paper called Attention is All You Need, uh, probably the most popular paper in the last, you know, from then to now, like no other paper has achieved a better citation than it uh, because it's such a revolutionary model type that changed the whole field of NLP. So with this model, um, <clears throat> it is able to uh, sort of like um, open the whole era that's called large language models. So before the, the invention of transformer, people were playing with RNNs, CNNs, and actually people are already playing with self-attention, but just not in the, in the, the whole transformer block. And those things has all has its own drawbacks. And so it prevented people from really building really large models, um, doing things really fast or able to process all the big data. But with Transformer, basically people are able to build really, really large language models. And by large, this is what I mean. So this is basically a snapshot of all the models that we've seen from say February, 2019, all the way to May, 2020. Different companies are trying to propose different models. So you can see the release date as kind of close to each other because everyone wants to uh, compete with each other in building larger and larger models. And though the table is telling you is that across the time proposed by different companies, you can see the model sets getting bigger and bigger. So this is the number of parameters. This is like never been seen before this level in, of, of parameters in vision or in any other tasks. Because in NLP, you have so many tax data which I put here. So that's a, the, the amount of data they use to train this model. Um, they are all, the training times are all in months. Uh, and of course, it depends on how many GPUs you use and how much budget you have, but uh, it's just massive, massive training using massive data and are able to build a model set that's never seen before. 1.5 billion, that was, um, you know, super surprising until later on, of course, with GPT-3, you have 170, 75 billion parameters, just a lot. And it's able to, of course, process more and more data. Um, I got all those numbers from their paper. Uh, some may be different, uh, like this one is smaller than this one, but I think um, some are reporting like compressed data size, some are reporting decompressed data size. It's kind of not very consistent across the papers. So yeah, take, take this with, with grain of salt, but basically you can go to each of their papers and realize you know, uh, how their training scheme is probably like very similar. So there's um, honestly very little really creativity in terms of like how they design the model or uh, what they use smartly with, with the data. Basically the whole creativity part is that they just made the model bigger and bigger uh, that is able to devour more and more data. And of course performs much, much better. They of course um, evaluate all those models against the, the leaderboard or the standard task that I mentioned before. And also, <clears throat> also all of them are language models though, so they're able to generate language so you can basically just see for yourself, uh, look at the past and know how well this model is. If it, can, if it can pass you as a human, if you can't tell whether it's generated by a machine or a human. So <clears throat> that's what our, we're living with these days, all these huge language models. Roseanne, just uh, in the interest yeah. of time, um, so we're a bit over now, do you want to take uh, maybe like seven more minutes and try and finish around 11.40, is that doable? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Uh, I have a part um, that I think I'll just omit, but uh, the oh, slides also, are um, yeah. look, look, we have a question from earlier from Sabrina. Um, okay. Thank you, do you want to unmute Sabrina and she can ask a question? Sabrina, if you're still here. Sorry, sorry, it was, uh, I, I, I don't have a question, sorry. It was, uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> if, if it comes up again, you feel free to ask in chat and we'll answer it. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> Cool. So, so basically we are, we are in this, like, this is where we live with now, uh, huge, huge language models. And it has made great things available, right? We are, we're able to see like for ourselves what great AI uh, technologies can do, how they can really uh, mimic human behavior in terms of language generation. And at the same time, they make the field a little bit more exclusive because they're so expensive and quite so much resources to train. Basically they only, um, the places only able to do them are just the big companies with a lot of, you know, fundings. So most make them uh, really uh, inaccessible to those outside of those big labs. Um, which is why I am asked a lot very often these days whether it is a good time, still a good time to get into NLP if 
all the big contributions are made by giant tech companies with unlimited resources. Because there's a, a vicious cycle here that if you want to, well, if it's great to get into an LP if you can just directly join those big companies and work on these large models. But as a student, you probably need um, some kind of a certificate to be able to do that. They probably want to know that you already work on NLP for, uh, for a while and know all the terms. You can study on your own, but it's very, very hard as a student in academia setting to be able to get your hands on you know, this big model training. So, um, so that's why I'm asked a lot of these questions a lot. And, and of course, in the end, it ups to, it's still up to all you guys, like what your interests are, do you find this piece of work interesting to make your career choice. But I also want to give two reasons that I'm pro, prone to answer yes. So one of the reasons that um, don't get disappointed by big models made out of big labs because they have a lot of resources because there are still creativities to be uncovered with small compute. Um, and the second point is that it's actually a very crucial time to get to NLP. I'll get to that point later. Um, Basically, the part I will go into omit for this lecture because uh, in the limit of time is that I wanted, wanted to tell you this one example of creating creative NLP work with small compute. Um, basically, is uh, it's a shameless plug. It's a paper of my own that's called Plug and Play Language Models. And all we do here is one GPU. We didn't use large compute. We didn't train anything, so we don't need to use large compute. But basically, uh, I'm going to skip this, so let me just move on to the next section. But basically what it does is that um, you take a GPT-2, which is pre-trained, which is released out there, and we are able to steal um, its generation to whatever we want. So we can make the prediction, the generation of the language more negative or more positive. And this part that I'm going to skip for now basically tells you how well this method works, but also there's no big compute involved in, in creating this paper. Uh, of course, when delivering the method, you need a GPU, but that's it. We The whole time, you anything uh, presented in this work, which is accepted at iClear 2020, can be done with one GPU. So don't get disappointed if all you see out there are big contributions made by you know thousands of GPUs trained for months. Um, there's still work you can do, even your limit, if you're limited by resource. So, so let's, let's move on to hopefully with that one data sample uh, that I happen to skip, I am able to make the point that there's still creativities that are almost orthogonal to how much compute you have because those, those computer people can make creativities in their, in their direction, but your direction is mostly, mostly orthogonal to theirs. Um, and actually a lot of creativity actually comes about when you have limitations. That's a thing that we see in science over and over again. So don't get disappointed um, if you are thinking about joining, you love this field, but you are intimidated by the big contributions made out there. The second point is that, uh, also my last point, is that it's actually a very crucial time to get into LP. Um, so the time that I prepared for this lecture, which is yesterday, is sort of like a big day in history. We've seen this happening. Uh, and this is just one uh, snapshot of one of the news articles because there are many out there that you probably are already known and for those in the US are also very uh, gravely affected by, by this incident. And I want to point out this one just because um, this is a picture by someone that's uh, a, known, very, a known QAnon conspiracy theorist, a uh, picture of him. And we, we all sort of are aware of what we are dealing with these days. There's a big division in our country and, and also across the world. And to some extent, we know that that's prepared by the social media. If you have watched you know, Social Dilemma or, or other documentaries. Uh, so these things are sort of the, what's behind the force to make it happen is the advance of tech, the advance of, you know, so many things people can read out there that they can basically just um, read whatever they want to read. And because there are so many misinformations um, that to some extent is made possible by the advance of technology, including NLP. So uh, of course, as someone working on technology, you also want to say that, well, I'm only in charge of making the theory, making the model. I'm not in charge of you know, creating all the harms out there that, you know, that's, that's, that's not something I can foresee. But something I want, this like half true, of course, we are computer scientists, we, we care about the essential algorithm, but we, something we want to probably say more to ourselves that is that to be more of a responsible human, that 
while you're creating the technology, maybe think more about um, the harm that you can create or how it can change culture, how it can change people's mind of thinking. Because people's mind, as it turns out, are more, way more flexible than we think. They can really just believe in anything out there. Uh, just a point that I wanted to make, just because this lecture happened in this crucial time. So what we've covered in this lecture is basically some of the basic elements of NLP, including word vectors, language modeling. We've covered RNNs and two transformers. Um, I wanted to tell you that small compute research still matters. And I wanted to basically say that if you find this piece, uh, this field interesting, don't be intimidated by large compute, but also think about how crucial it is a time to take a responsible stand working in LP. If you are working in LP, if you're not, maybe it's a good time to think about working on it and be a responsible researcher there. Cool, thanks for joining this lecture. And uh, thanks for standing, staying with me throughout this lecture that's over you know, 100 minutes long now. Uh, this is my contact info. Feel free to get in touch whenever you can. Thank you so Thank much, Rosanne. That was, that was amazing. Yeah, Thank you. Um, for students, um, we have our regular lab at 1, which goes till 3. And then this afternoon, starting at 3.15, we have an AMA with grad students, which includes all of the grad student organizers and possibly a few more people. So if you have any questions uh, about grad school or research as a grad student in general, please stop by. It'll be a regular Zoom meeting, so it'll be more and more casual. Um, thank you again, Roseanne. This was really awesome. That was, a, that was quite a feat to cover that much material. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, folks.